Hello, welcome to Truth for Today. This is Dai Qingyuan, your host and teacher, pastor of Abilene Bible Church. Today we are continuing our study of I Pray. This is the third series in the big series of I Christian. Jesus Christ taught us how to pray. Uh, he gave us the Lord's Prayer in two places in the New Testament, in Matthew and in Luke. In Matthew, it was quoted as an example of uh, how we must um, apply this reciprocity in the horizontal relationships uh, in to man to man. There's a certain sense of that you get what you give. Yeah, you must give mercy in order to obtain mercy. You must be forgive in order to be forgiven. It's for that point this was quoted in the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, in Luke, it was given as an example of how to pray. So in both places, the Lord's Prayer exists as both a template and uh, an example of the content. So it is worth looking into. In this Lord's Prayer, there are four concepts for the vertical relationship, four concepts for the horizontal, and then in the two loves. Of course, love the Lord and love others, so it's equally important. Do you see that? The Bible gives us a clear pattern, okay, that two di di directions, two dimensions of relationship are equally important to us. Okay. About the vertical relationship in the Lord's Prayer, there are four concepts. Our Father, who art in heaven, the key concept, Father. Hallowed be thy name, the key concept, name. Okay, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So the four concepts are Father, name, kingdom, and will. We are doing now uh, the uh, idea about thy name. Okay, the word name in the Bible is more than what we normally use today. Name today is just a, a, a denomination, <laughs> you know, it's a name, something you call a group. It's called a denomination. You know, a, 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 it, it's a title. It's a inscription. You can even say it, it's an uh, um, just a sign <laughs> for something or some person name. But in the Bible, name means uh, the person. Okay, hallowed be thy name means mean may you personally be exalted. And the person is related with his character, his moral nature. And uh, uh, the character of God can be described by man uh, in the attributes of God. And that's where we are now. The attributes of God. It is it's such a big topic, we could explode on this. But we are just giving you the general idea here, because the key concept is about God's name, okay? And the name is talking about the person, the character, and uh, the attributes. When you talk about, hallowed be thy name, think about God's character and his attributes in these three classes. That God is, has a existential, a group of exten existential attributes. That's about his um, uh, self-existence, self-satisfaction and self-determination. Um, and the second group is about God's power attributes, that is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Okay? These are all about God being God. Okay? He's great. You know, when the children pray, say, before the, 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 the dinner, I ask my children sometimes just they, they give thanks, they pray, and they just use the simplest one. God is great, God is good, thank you God for the food. That actually is sufficient to describe God. God is great, he is, that means he is, um, that includes his uh, existential attributes and uh, his power attributes. Okay? And God is good, that's about his moral attributes. And that's where we want to explore today. God is good, and this is related with his moral attributes. 
Okay, and uh, what does uh, more attribute include? Well, um, first of all, uh, it starts from God's holiness. Okay, the word uh, holiness means uh, he is um, separated from the world. He is different. He he is uh, high up. He is above. Okay, and uh, the holiness therefore you might include it. Um, or associate with his uh, um, existential attributes because he is he exists being different because he only is eternal right everything else is created and uh, uh, but on the other hand the holiness has gained a um, a connotation related with moral attributes okay because God is holy um, is uh, not really talking about he uh, his being mighty. It's talking about he is, um, is um, pure. That morally he is pure. He has no sin. He has no darkness in him. He has no error in him. And he has no evil in him. Everything in God is pure. And is 100% absolutely Good, and uh, the, in that sense, God is holy. Okay, so when we talk about God, you are holy. Now we are talking about God being morally absolutely um, without sin, without evil, and being purely, totally, hundred percent good. Okay, so hallowed be your name. That means you remember that Him being holy in the moral sense. And uh, holiness is related with the concept of uh, righteousness. Okay? The righteousness uh, in, uh, in Hebrew is, um, really, uh, is in the word uh, uh, tzedek. Uh, and uh, it, it means being right, uh, being correct. In everything he does is, um, is uh, um, is right. It's just simply right. It cannot be wrong in any sense. Okay, and uh, um, God is right because right or wrong is defined by agreeing with God's moral uh, character or not. Because how do you define right and wrong? Without God, you cannot define it. You can only say, well, it's relatively speaking, according to me, it's right or wrong. But you could be selfish and, uh, and self-centered and hurtful to others. So what's right for you may not be right for others. You know? So without God, without the concept of God being eternal and absolute and holy, there's no way for human beings to define what is uh, the absolutely right or wrong. Everything will become relative. So. Um, in the world, there's an Eastern and Western culture uh, in, until recently. And in the Western culture, there are two sides. There's a, a, a humanism in the Greco-Roman culture, but there is this uh, um, Hebrew Christian culture, which has the theism there. And it's actually because of that culture and the worldview that comes with it, in the West, uh, Western culture, there has been um, for about 2,000 years, a uh, general framework of absolute right and wrong, what's good and what's evil. Okay? However, that uh, framework dissolved okay, or began to crumble um, from the, uh, well, actually starting from the, um, the Renaissance and then the Reformation and, and then, then there's the, the modernization and the modern liberalization. And it's a gradual process. But anyway, the mo in the modern time, this uh, framework of absolute right and wrong has been uh, crumbling. And uh, it's almost dissolved now. So now it actually turned upside down. <laughs> what is right is considered wrong, and what's wrong is considered right. You know, with the recent things about uh, um, redefinition of marriage, and uh, you know, and 
I have just so many things I can't list them. But at least I know what is uh, what people consider tolerant these days. They are never tolerant of people who believe in the biblical worldview. So I see today it's like uh, Isaiah's time when darkness is called light and light is called darkness. And um, it's sad, but it's prophesied and it's going to happen, but it will not be forever. So it's okay. Uh, we just know that uh, God is the foundational concept for up upon which for us to define righteousness. Because what is right? What is uh, good? Well, whatever agrees with God's character is right and good. What disagrees is not. Okay. So God's holiness saying that he is saying that He is pure, 100% morally right, and the right, the being right is described by the word righteousness. Okay, and uh, um, and the righteousness when it is applied on uh, how to deal with error, sin, and evil, and that concept becomes justice. Okay, uh, in uh, in Hebrew, it's a shopa, uh, sh uh, sofat, and the shopa team is judge. So justice is related with righteousness. Uh, justice is actually righteousness at work in dealing with uh, wrongs and with sins and evils. Okay? So the basic concept of justice in the Bible is that you need to punish wrongs uh, not more or less than the damage it has done. Okay? So the idea of an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, it was not meant to be cruel. It was meant actually to be right, okay? to be correct and not overdo uh, justice. Okay? Because before the biblical law, the Mosaic law came, justice in the world was done by blood avengers. Okay? And uh, if your relative had been killed, and I, uh, your clan will f hire uh, some blood avengers and they will kill m more uh, than you know, it has been done on your side. So justice is always been overdone by people. And God gave us the law to demand us to not overdo and do it just right. You see, that's part of, therefore, ju justice is part of righteousness in application in dealing with evil. Okay? And God is just. Uh, so he, whatever he decides to judge as the judge, uh, as the overall judge of all things, he is always correct in his judgment. Okay. So everybody who is in hell, whatever punishment they receive will always fit their sin and their e the evil they have done. Okay. So you can believe that in hell there will be um, some people who suffer more than others. Okay. I believe for, for Hitler and Stalin and, and uh, Mao, these type of people, they're going to suffer more because they have committed more damages. And there will be those who are simply unfortunate because they are born uh, outside of this, um, the step of the gospel, you know, the, the flow of the gospel. So they did not know Jesus Christ. And then uh, they don't go to heaven, but they suffer for their sin, but no more than what they deserve. You just have to believe that God is just. Okay, because he is righteous, because he is holy. Okay, and those are all God's moral attributes. And God's justice demands that all sins be punished correctly. And since every human being is a sinner except Jesus Christ, therefore we all deserve to be punished. Okay, to the extent that we deserve. Okay. And uh, what is the just punishment for sin? The wage of sin is death. Okay. And death includes three kinds. The spiritual death, which all of us are born in, ever since Adam uh, <laughs> disobeyed God and ate forbidden fruit, we 
Uh, he spiritually died immediately. He lost his personal fellowship relationship with God immediately. And then he began to physically die. Well, he lived for, I, mean, I think, 930 years after that. Uh, but he began physically to die. Okay, but he spiritually he's immediately dead. He lost his relation with God, and um, if he did not n believe in the gospel, which was um, hinted in Genesis three fifteen, uh, the son of the woman, uh, the the seed of the woman will um, will break the head of the serpent, and that implies. Jesus Christ. Okay, every man is a son of a woman, but only Jesus Christ is only son of woman because he's not a son of a man. He's son of God. All right. He calls himself son of man because that means he is the new Adam. Okay, man, Adam lost the kingship over the world, but the son of man, the new Adam, will regain the kingship over the whole world. Okay, so he calls him son of man. Actually, that's not a humble title. That actually is a claim to be the king of the world. It's a very exalted title. Okay, but um, the justice of God requires that all men be punished with death. Okay, spiritual death, you are born with it, and uh, physical death, you are going that way, and eternal death, that's is what you will get if you don't believe in the gospel. Okay? And the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Before his first coming, um, from Adam to Noah and all of uh, Jews, they believed in the God who gave them the law, and in the law there is a sacrifice, sacrificial system, and in the sacrificial system, Jesus Christ was implied in typology. So if they believe in that God and in his gospel, in, in this implied uh, gospel, uh, it, uh, they will be saved. Salvation is by faith alone, faith in the gospel about Jesus Christ. And ever since Jesus' first coming, we have to believe in him explicitly. We have to know his name. There's no other name under heaven by which man can be saved. So we have to believe both in God and in Christ to be saved. People who deny Jesus being Son of God, Son of Man, you know, um, died on the cross and resurrected from the dead, if people don't believe it today, even if they just don't know about it, they are still lost. Heaven is a place for the family of God. So people who are uh, who don't believe they are em enemies of God, who pe people who don't know they are strangers of God and not part of the family. Therefore, they don't belong to heaven. Okay? And uh, uh, the um, justice of God demands that man be punished, and punished with death. And however, there's another side of God that demands another direction. God is not only righteous and just, which demands punishment, but God is also merciful, graceful, and loving. And that will um, push for the direction of forgiveness <laughs> and, um, and salvation. So God is merciful uh, is in the sense that God does not want to give us what we deserve. Okay? What do we deserve? Since we are sinners, we deserve death. Okay, uh, all three levels of them. Okay, we are already in one. We are in the process of another, and the potentially the last one. Okay, and um, sin, um, spiritual death is the soul separation from God. Physical death is the soul separation from the body, and uh, the eternal death is the spirit and soul and body all together with the resurrected body, being separated from God forever. Okay, and. Uh, we are in the process, going that direction. Everybody is marching to hell. Okay? And uh, the gospel, the good news, Jesus Christ died for all, and the, the, the gift was wrapped and put on a bow and the, at everybody's door. But unless you are chosen by God and He works on you, giving you the prevenient grace and uh, give you a life experience and enlighten you, you will not be interested 
in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You still think you are the king of the world, you want to be in control of your life, and you don't, maybe you don't trust in others, but you don't trust in God either. And the key of salvation is not to take control of your own life. The key is to entrust your life to the good Lord. Okay? That's a life of a saved person. So, God, um, in his justice, he must punish us. But in his mercy, he doesn't want to give us what we deserve. Okay? That's being mercy. And uh, he is graceful in a sense that he wants to give us what we don't deserve. Okay? Uh, mercy is don't give us what we deserve, death. And uh, grace is give us what we don't deserve, which is life. Okay? And uh, which is a, a personal, loving relationship. And uh, which is being um, changed from an, an enemy of God, a stranger of God, to not only the forgiven criminals, but also adopted as sons and reborn into the family and be part of the bride of Christ. And so in living in a love relationship, promised with Jesus' life, he raised his hands, I will come again to take you. And uh, you trust in him and then you will have the courage and ability to live for him. And that is the love. Okay, of God. Okay. So why is God merciful? Trying not to give us what we deserve. Why is God graceful? Trying to give us something we don't deserve. Because He is love. Okay. To say that God is love requires understanding that God is Trinitarian. Okay. If God is a Unitarian, one person, one God and one person, then He cannot be love forever. Because love is a relationship. Love demands the existence of more than one person. Each person has the mind, the heart, and the will. And uh, love is to uh, trying to live for the other, not for self. And trying to understand the other before demanding being understood. Trying to give rather than receive. You know, tr uh, and trusting rather than hiding. Okay, and that is love. And this kind of relationship exists ontologically within the Godhead, within the Trinitarian God. Okay? The Father loves the Son so much so that He will give everything, create everything for the purpose of honoring the Son and giving to the Son. And He will let the Son have everything that God created. The Son loves the Father so much that He will obey and submit to the Father, and he was willing to give up his own life to redeem whomever God has chosen and, and made for the Son. And then, um, uh, by the trust in the Father, the Son gave the example for the redeemed to follow. Okay? So, Jesus Christ, when he was on earth, he he emptied himself, emptied himself, not all of his divine attributes. If you read the context in, um, in uh, um, Philippians 2, and uh, uh, you know, he emptied himself, but the context is about being, become humble, become a servant, and even to die on the cross. So he humbled himself by, he cannot remove his existential attributes, but he can empty himself of his power attributes. He, when he was on earth, he was not by himself omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. Okay? He knew only what the Father reveals to him, and those things he revealed to us. And uh, he could do only what the Holy Spirit gave him the ability to do, okay? and, uh, and uh, he was only present <laughs> in, in, as a person there. Uh, and however, he's, um, uh, he, he did this because of his love of the Father. And the Holy Spirit loves the Father and Son so much that he now maintains the persons that God the Father has chosen, that God the Son has redeemed, and God the Holy Spirit will maintain and preserve and beautify and, uh, uh, and uh, will sanctify all the way till the time when the church will become the bride of Christ. So 
um, the love exists ontologically within the Trinitarian uh, Godhead, and that love is now uh, given to us. God poured down his love to us so that we may receive it, and we may learn of it, we may react to it, and then we may act based on it to others, therefore representing the Trinitarian God, who is morally holy, ju righteous, just, merciful, graceful, and loving. You see, all of these moral attributes form a one chain. It's self-consistent, and uh, it uh, tells us who God is. It also tells us what we should do in response to God's love and uh, to God's love, and also how to live after we have received His love. Okay, the there is a hard side of God, because if He's righteous and judge, uh, just, He needs to punish. The cross is necessary, but his good side is that he wants to forgive and love. Therefore, the cross is necessary. Amen. Dear viewers, after we have asked you to inquire from God about his will on the ministry of truth for today, many of you prayed to our Lord and heard his voice, and let us know by calling, writing, and giving. We have heard your collective voice that most current viewers prefer to keep the program on the air, even though putting it on the internet has the potential of reaching more people, even the younger generation. Our service to the viewers now, especially the housebound, should be maintained as is. But expansion to the internet is welcomed as a backup for those who missed the broadcast and as a development for the future. To reach both goals, Truth for Today must become a viewer-supported ministry. Many of you have already taken up the responsibility of making the ministry your own. From the time we asked of you till now, we have received about two-thirds of the cost for running it on the air, not counting the staffing and production costs. The leadership of Abilene Bible Church has reached the conclusion that it is clearly God's will for us to keep the ministry on the air for those who need it, mostly the older generation, and on the internet for the potential viewers in the younger generation. Even if we have not received all the funding yet, but a year is young, only three months passed from the time we inquired of you, and God is big. He will provide the church and the viewers to share the cost. We will submit to God's will and rely on Him as we walk by faith. It will be a challenging but exciting journey. Let us walk together with open eyes, for the Lord said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. This is our decision, and we hope to hear from you.